Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to another, another webinar Wednesday hosted by Cal State Bakersfield Small Business Development Center. I'm Kelly Bearden. I'm the director of the center and your webinar host today. Got a great program, going to be all around the economy, some great financing tips, great financing programs, changes. Oh, it's December 13th, webinar number 302. Let's get things rolling. And today is December 13th, 2023. And today we're going to talk about all you need to know about SBA fixed asset financing. Financing for fixed assets, you know, your land, your buildings, your equipment, etc. Uh, some great programs and some great things going on locally and uh, some changes going on locally. And we're going to talk about the changes ahead for the 504 program, talk about uh, the value that it could be for your small business as well. You know, here it comes, the Corporate Transparency Act, and we're going to mention that and a uh, little warning moving forward for the next uh, couple of months. We'll probably mention it a lot as we try to educate more individuals on the need for them to provide their private information into this massive federal database. Economic Corner is back, and it features our win webinar Wednesday resident economist. So Dr. Evans will be joining us in a little bit to add a, his twist on what is happening in the economy and how it affects businesses, small businesses, and others. So Dr. Evans will be here today. Our capital quarter, we're just going to celebrate bargain interest rates. And yes, there are a couple of programs where there are bargain interest rates in this day of high age prime rates and high age interest rates. There's some bargains out there, and we're going to, you know, celebrate a couple of those. We will quickly talk about the disaster program as, as the deadline is coming up for some of the idle loans. So there is, there's still the economic injury disaster loans. We're not talking about if your business had storm damage or anything like that. We're talking about if your business was damaged economically, if your sales went down, if your main customer dried up, et cetera, uh, your supplier other vendors potentially, other reasons it could have happened, um, distribution, et cetera. So it will also let you know some of the resources and business tools. As always, we will answer your questions live toward the conclusion of today's webinar. So if you have a question today, go to the Q&A box and put the question in there. Um, and also, we will have resources in our chat box. And we do have a poll today. So Let's go to our poll question. Our poll question is a little bit on the whimsical side. It's on the fun side of Webinar Wednesday. So let's, first of all, you know, notice it's a kind of the whimsical kind. So, but it's, you know, the holidays are near and, you know, I think everybody's kind of involved in this. And so our poll question is going to be on a list of the 29 insanely cool gadget gifts. So as we launch the poll question, according to consumerbags.com, which of these four items is not on the list of 29 insanely cool gadget gifts? Gifts. Is it the light bulb camera? Miracle sheets? Is it the galaxy ball? Or is it the AI crap detector? So we have the light bulb camera, miracle sheets, galaxy ball, and also the artificial intelligence crap detector. So do have plenty of time for you to jump in and review those three or four items. One of them is not on the list. And I will give you a hint. The other three are numbers one, two, and three on the list. So we are looking at the poll. And uh, the poll has, has ended and stopped sharing. I don't know what happened there. But um, so we did have a poll question going on. It something happened. We will share the results as my poll question ended with only 15% of you in. And the correct answer to this, I'm sure many of you would have got, but I thought I could stump you by somehow um, ending the poll early. And I, I don't know how that happened, but it did. But it is the AI crap detector. Boy, and I tell you, if you have an artificial intelligence crap detector, I'm thinking you can make billions of dollars. So Somebody get cracking on that. But the light bulb camera, the miracle sheets, and the galaxy ball 
all on the top three of the 29 insanely cool gadget gifts for 2023. Okay, moving right along. Um, our Corporate Transparency Act, we talk about it a little bit now. It's coming effective the January 1, 2024. The Corporate Transparency Act will affect your business if you are a business uh, corporation or an LLC, or it very well may affect you. Uh, the Corporate Transparency Act was enacted to try to find, you know, bad players uh, in a lot of different areas that are doing illegal activities, such as uh, financing terrorism, maybe some human and draft tracking, money laundering, fraud, etc. And so what it is doing is it's a broad reach effort in order to have individuals provide their personal information. So the reason behind this law is that in many states, or at least you know a handful of states, uh, individuals can form a corporation or a legal entity, an LLC, for example, without providing their personal information. And it is um, the federal government's um, and Congress's notion that, that this could lead to a lot of illegal activity, uh, such as the crimes that I had mentioned. So it will affect many companies and individuals. It'll affect far beyond those engaged in illegal activity. But really, if, if you aren't uh, up to date and into this, there are significant penalties that will incur. You can incur uh, up to $500 a day. And really, it seems like um, they're going to find the people who are not in this database that are the bad actors in this whole thing. So um, you need to register your personal information into a federal database. The database is not open yet. Uh, the form that they are going to be using is not open. Um, and we'll continue to look for that to happen and update you when that does. So, you know, before, before this, you know, entities would go and they would file with the Secretary of State's office, like here in the state of California. And, but now you have to do much more than that. If you do file an entity with the Secretary of State and you can LLC incorporate its own legal entity for your business, you must also now file a beneficial ownership report and do that within 90 days into a non-public I repeat, this is a non-public federal database, and it is with FinCEN. And FinCEN is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. So the federal government will share this database with uh, allies and other governments and maybe local governments as they try to uh, find some of those bad actors creating those financial crimes. So before you would have a public filing, but it did not disclose the full ownership of the organization. And again, this is only true in about a handful of states, but it was allowing a lot of, of individuals to form those entities without reporting the percentage of ownership, without reporting their personal information, including their full name, their address, their date of birth, you know, a government issue photo ID or any unique number such as a passport, social security, or, or driver's license. So that is all changing where that information and much of that information is going to be provided and it is going to be a report called the Beneficial Ownership Report, the BOI. So before some states allowed entities to register without the detailed information and that is now going to be changing as well. So that's on the Corporate Transparency Act. We'll continue to bring more information to you on how to do this. So please do, when you get the opportunity, you know, jump in and actually uh, do that filing. Again, the fees, the penalties for that is going to be $500 a day. Last time my math was correct, that was $15,000 a month. That's not good. Okay, so a little bit also, we're coming up on some of the disaster relief that was available after the winter disaster storms. And here's a, a picture up, up, up by the Yosemite area, and maybe even in Yosemite National Park, one of my favorite places. And you'll see that uh, a lot of erosion underneath the road caved that in, and from, from high water running and other things. Now, not too many of you own state highways, so I know you're not going to want to file a particular claim on that. 
And really, this is kind of the year, you know, at a different elevation, but uh, maybe same elevation. This is how a normal winter looks. So right now we have in, uh, disaster loans that are expiring on a couple of different programs. And one of them is the 2022 Fork Fire that was uh, based in, um, I believe it was in Fresno County, uh, up in the Bass Lake area, and uh, did a lot of damage. And if you had... Uh, your business was interrupted because of the fork fire and your cash flow was significantly crimped. You know, there are resources available to help your business uh, if you can qualify for the economic injury disaster loans. Uh, so that is going to be expiring the first week in January. Uh, so we have one more webinar to, to mention this, and that's going to be it. But also the winter storms that occurred mostly in February and March of 2023 and produced some of the pictures that we saw previously. So the winter storms also are going to be expiring with the economic injury disaster loans that same week. Also, there is that, that provision where you, know, you can actually do mitigation. And really, it's really one of the things that I think a lot of business owners miss out on. And that is you have a property that can flood uh, with these, you know, you know, every other decade floods or uh, the 25 year flood or the 50 year flood or whatever. And here's an opportunity for you to prevent that type of loss in the future by actually getting disaster funds at low interest rates between two and three eighths and four and three quarters percent in order to do that mitigation and to prevent that type of loss in the future. And if it can provide you some, you know, business relief as well, maybe it helps your space, uh, it maybe prevents and, and helps you become more efficient in your operations. It's really a non, it's really a win-win for your private nonprofits and your uh, homeowner and business purposes. So the mitigation is really something that a lot of people miss out on. I think the disaster loans for if you had any physical damage, are, those are closed, but there's still the economic injury disaster loan. And again, you can get up to $2 million in working capital at rates at 3.30%. And that's incredibly cheap money considering where uh, money is costing these days. So do know that you do have until the first week I believe around the 4th of January, in order to get those applications in, you can contact the SPDC. We can help you with those particular issues if they become a problem for you. So let's bring in Dr. Mark Evans. He's our Webinar Wednesday resident economist, our emeritus professor at Cal State Bakersfield, over 40 years at CSUB. He co-founded the Kern Economic Journal. Dr. Evans, take it away. Good afternoon. I'm glad you guys can spend your lunch hour with us today. If I don't see you uh, between now and the holidays, have a great holiday season and uh, we'll pick up again next year. But what I thought I would do today is uh, uh, just touch base on the current budget situation, as well as uh, some more longer run thoughts on the budget. So, uh, you probably remember that the McCarthy-Biden deal uh, established a continuing resolution that took us through November 17th of the current fiscal year. It established spending caps for uh, Congress to use for, for this fiscal year, as well as the 2024-25 fiscal year, suspended the debt ceiling uh, till January 1st, 2025, so uh, what's happened uh, since we last discussed this is uh, uh, new continuing resolutions have been approved that run through January 19th or February 2nd, depending on the, the area of spending. Uh, so shortly into the new year, what we're going to see is the really the, the same uh, jockeying back and forth by uh, Congress in terms of what to do next. Uh, if there ever is a budget, it'll have to require joint approval by the House, which has a Republican majority, and the Senate, which has a Democratic majority. So stay tuned. Uh, now for the longer run situation, uh, as you all know, we have an increasing debt to GDP ratio that's uh, approaching scary levels. Uh, 
the borrowing costs increasingly will cry, crowd out everything else uh, or require quite large tax increases or a little bit of both. Uh, population aging is driving the huge increases in Social Security and Medicare. And uh, uh, with the increasing uh, debt ratio, there's diminishing fiscal space to manage any future large scale events such as wars, natural disasters, financial panics, et cetera. Another big problem is just the gridlock. Uh, Congress seems incapable of passing any budget as well as the political brinksmanship and that every time we need a new CR uh, or uh, to extend the statutory debt ceiling, uh, we get into a situation where there's a near fiscal crisis due to the politics of the situation. Uh, here's a, a graph of the debt GDP ratio. Uh, it shows why we do need fiscal space, why we need a little bit of a cushion, because the debt does go up enormously as a fraction of GDP whenever something like a war, a Great Depression, uh, or pandemic happens. Uh, higher interest rates. Uh, uh, currently, the interest on the debt is as large as all the R&D infrastructure and education spending of the federal government. Uh, it's projected by 2053 uh, to be as much as 6.7% of GDP, just the interest alone on the debt. So yes, it's going to squeeze out a lot of things that, that uh, really are important to us. Um, especially Social Security, Medicare, by 2034, reserves will be exhausted on Social Security. The incoming revenue will cover only 80% of benefits. Uh, Medicare, we're going to have problems by 2031. Uh, as we'll see on the next slide, uh, any uh, proposal to reduce benefits or increase revenues is, is uh, severely attacked for political gain, and I might add successfully attacked. On the right, uh, what this bar graph shows is the percentage of each year that we actually go without a budget, okay? From 1998 to 2010, uh, it was a third of each fiscal year on average. Since 2011, it's now inching up to almost 50% of each year uh, we go without a approved budget. So what do we do? Okay, here's some things, uh, some things that maybe we could fix, maybe some rules that we have added in the past, uh, uh, specifically to to better manage the budget. The stuff on the left with the Hastert rule where the House Speaker uh, really doesn't schedule any bill that isn't uh, favored by a majority of his of the majority party or his own party, even if it has overwhelmingly support. Uh, the Senate filibuster, which has now evolved to the point where just about everything requires a supermajority. Uh, we have requirements to raise official requirements to raise the debt ceiling, uh, extend a continuing resolution. Possibly these could be made automatic to to reduce the threat of fiscal crises. The stuff on the right is things we've done. Uh, appropriation caps, paygo requirements, where if you increase the the uh, the uh, above the spending cap in one area, you have to decrease spending in another sequestration if that's necessary to to reach the or to not exceed the spending cap uh, we've had bipartisan debt commissions um, everything on the left is something that could be done that might help the situation but congress isn't going to do it everything on the right is something congress did but then they very quickly undid because no no congress can tie the hands of a future congress so uh, that's the situation. Uh, let's look at the one bright spot, the, the Clinton years, where the debt to D GDP ratio, it did decline significantly. Um, now, what happened here is economic advisors and political advisors uh, clashed, and the economic advisors prevailed, at least in the short run. Uh, because the Clinton administration did come up with a budget uh, that had a mix of spending de decreases and revenue increases, 
that allowed the debt to GDP ratio to, to fall by quite a bit. Um, budget caps were imposed, they were honored. Uh, PAYGO was in effect where we actually had to make some changes to entitlement programs to make sure we stayed within the caps. Now, here's the politics of it, though. This is kind of interesting. Uh, in 93, uh, when the budget was structured for the, for the Clinton years, uh, Democrats held an 82-person majority in the House. They also controlled the, the Senate. Uh, even with an 82-person majority, the budget itself won by only two votes. So if one more person would have changed their vote from positive to negative. It would have been a tie. And in the House, there is no tiebreaker. We would not have had the budget that we had uh, in these years. Okay. Interestingly, the Democrats actually, uh, okay, the only real uh, time that we've been successful in terms of bringing down the debt uh, to GDP ratio shortly after Democrats lost control of both the House and the Senate in 1994. I guess you could say the political advisors prevailed, not the economic advisors, because the lesson ever since has been you touch the deficit, you're going to lose. I think Congress cannot solve the problem because they do what they uh, uh, what they do that to, to get reelected. Okay, What about a constitutional amendment focusing on the debt to GDP ratio? Well, everybody is finally kind of, uh, it seems like they're being uh, more concerned. Uh, so I don't know. I think you have to raise the, the question that uh, do we need a constitutional amendment of some sort? Because Congress seems completely incapable of solving the problem. And when they do do it successfully, we vote the people out of office that, that had a role in addressing the deficit. Now, if there were a, a budget amendment, it would not have to be uh, so severe as a balanced budget amendment. Uh, what these graphs show is the period from post-World War II through 1980. So from 1950 to 1980, the debt to GDP ratio actually fell from 80% to 25%. Uh, you see that on the bottom graph. Uh, what the top graph shows is that throughout these years, we pretty much ran a deficit for the most part, uh, but it was it, it was a smaller deficit than we're running now. It was about 1.1% of GDP. So even with a deficit, you can decrease the debt to GDP ratio as long as it's not a, a deficit of uh, the magnitudes that we're getting now. What do we know? We know that in general, People do not like what's going on in Congress. Only 15% approve of how Congress is handling its job. Do most members of Congress deserve to be uh, reelected? 77% say no. Uh, people are generally not happy with Republicans or Democrats as a group, but they do like their own representative. What can we conclude here? I think, one, uh, we have a problem. Legislators are incapable of, of addressing it. They... They cannot negotiate. They they cannot secure the votes to be reelected if they address it. Uh, we know that a few voters even know what their representative's track record is uh, or their commitment to relating to the deficit. So what are we going to do? I think uh, I really see no way out unless uh, basically we have engaged, informed, single issue voters that are holding legislators fiscally accountable, you know, a big part of our uh, you know, voting block. Uh, and possibly it may also require uh, constitutional constraints of some kind. So we've met the many, the enemy and it is us. Who is us? It's both us that vote people in and, and, and what, and what it takes to stay in. So with that, I'll pass the baton back to uh, Kelly. That brings us to our special guest speakers today. And uh, the first one is, is Frank Lagos, and he's the CEO of the executive director of the Syncal Business Finance Group based in Fresno. Uh, is valued $155 million. Uh, Sam is Central Valley native, 50, uh, 36 years of banking experience, includes community outreach to uh, organizations 
with this 504 program, the SBA 504 program since 2005. He has served as a board member on Governor Newsom's partnership for the San Joaquin Valley. Jump on in here, Frank, and uh, I'm going to introduce Keith next, and we'll get started on the next part of our program here. And that is going to be, I like, this is my favorite introduction slide for Keith Bryce, and we had several of them. Uh, just a, a veteran of Webinar Wednesday, uh, dozens and dozens of appearances, co-sponsor, guest host, you name it. Um, this was the uh, the moment that I really, really, you got to be most proud of when you're uh, giving the, only 35 individuals have received the John Brock Award uh, as for outstanding citizens in our community, uh, recognized and contributions and providing students with much needed scholarships. Um, great partner for CSUB. Um, fantastic career, banking and the CDC. We'll talk about that coming in. Jump on in here, Keith. Hey, thank you, Kelly. I'm, I'm always flattered to, to hear your introduction of myself. And, and I'm, I'm really excited to be on this Zoom with Frank. Frank and I are, are close friends and, and we're going to talk a little bit about how that, that friendship has evolved into a, a greater partnership. Uh, one thing I, I want to mention in, in Dr. Evans, uh, and Kelly, he's a must every quarter on your webinars at minimum, if not every month. Uh, I, I always glean information uh, from him that you know I use not only in, in, in mid-state, but in my personal life. Give me a little bit of insight there. So uh, I, I will tell you, uh, Frank and I operate a what's called a zero subsidy program. So all of that negative information you saw about the federal government, the SBA 504 program is zero subsidy. And what that means is we make money for the federal government. So there, there is not a cost to the federal government or to the taxpayers for our program. And we're, we're quite proud of that. Uh, and that's a result of a lot of hard work by a lot of individuals, both uh, inside of the SBA and then the partners such as Frank and myself outside of the SBA. And more importantly, a lot of our uh, loans and our borrowers, uh, because our loans have a, a great history of uh, repayment uh, it allows the program to continue with with a zero subsidy status. So uh, that's always exciting to say. Uh, and I think uh, through my history with the SBA, I think there was only one year period where we were not at a zero subsidy. And I think that was during the Great, Great Recession when we had several uh, defaults. In many cases, we're lumped in with the the PPP and the idle disaster loans, and those are, in many cases, that's a direct loan from the SBA. Ours is not. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we get into our presentation. Hopefully, Frank's going to indulge me uh, because this is my last webinar Wednesday, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, share a a quick uh, program on what the program, the SBA 504 program is about, and then we'll dive into some of the exciting changes that, that both Frank and I have, and I'm sure Kelly has some questions. So with that, Kelly, I am going to share my screen uh, if possible. And while you're doing that, I will just mention that the SBA 504 program uh, throughout my career as working with advising small businesses is really one of the great programs for business owners. And it's really something if you can't qualify today, qualify a year from today or two years from today. It's that good. So uh, everybody see my screen here real quick. We got you. Okay, good, good. And uh, you you notice the Mid-State SynCal uh, Finance Group conversion. Well, uh, it's going to be one of those graphs where you're going to see Mid-State going into Cal, uh, SynCal and SynCal coming in at the end. So uh, just, just uh, this is thrown together fairly quickly. 
So I, I've always loved this slide, you know, on how to get an SBA loan. And, and uh, it always looks like a maze, but in true reality, it's not. Uh, both Frank and I have uh, done, uh, you know, thousands of loans. And we've started at the, the front end and ended at the end with success. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, it's always good visual. This gives you an example of the types of uh, buildings that that uh, can be done under the final floor loan program. Uh, these are just happen to be Kern County buildings, but but with the news that we're going to talk to about later, you're going to see very similar type of buildings up and down the valley. Uh, high speed rail. Uh, I know Frank and the Fresno corridor there have done several projects that have uh, had businesses uh, that were required to relocate and beneficiary of of high speed rail. So uh, warehouse, again, giving you a flavor of the type of 504 loans that uh, can be done with the program. Hotels, uh, the SBA is the largest hotel lender in the country. Uh, Frank's group, uh, along with local Mint State, uh, expert hotel lenders uh, can have done uh, a number of well-known projects uh, throughout the various communities that we serve. Uh, auction house, again, you get a flavor of the type of building. Uh, plumbing contractors, if, if they need a building, uh, you uh, if you're going to look for, for some of the best financing, I think, you're going to look at the SBA, finance, uh, SBA 504 program. Uh, you know, we're a nonprofit uh, organized, both, both CINCAL and MidState were organized around about the same time, uh, give or take a year in in either direction. Uh, and our whole model is to assist small businesses in financing growth. Uh, the exciting thing is, is CINCAL offers a couple other loan programs that are going to be introduced to our community. So that's that's just, uh, we're, we're tickled pink in the direction we're going to go. About the 504 program, it's commercial loans for expanding businesses. Uh, very rarely do we get people knocking on our door and saying, hey, we've lost money for the last three years. We want to buy a building. It's usually we are doing very well. Uh, we're excited. Uh, we need more space. And with the 504 program, they get fixed rate below market financing. We do financing primarily for fixed assets, 20 to 25 year term and typically 10 year terms for equipment. Uh, advantages, long term below market uh, fixed rates. Rates are trending in the positive direction. Uh, we got our last uh, notification and we were back in the six and a half percent range. So uh, that's not where we were two years from now, but it is trending in the right direction. It allows lenders to provide 90 percent financing and especially the smaller independent lenders. They can participate in larger transactions. They love the program. You know, they're loan the value. They're in a first lien position. We'll show you how that's structured. Uh, they're at 50 percent loan value. So if the deal goes bad, they're knocking on either Frank's door or my door and saying, hey, uh, we have a problem here. What are we going to do? Uh, my staff uh, has probably already shared this with Frank that that uh, we always talk about the devils in the details. And and if I love cartoons and it says here, technically he's right. It says right there, they're in the contract. Uh, the customer may, may pay off the loan with a single balloon payment. Uh, we That's one of the types of uh, loans that that uh, we do under the 504 program, especially on a refinance where they have a, a balloon payment coming due on a construction loan or an interim loan. Uh, that's well within our wheelhouse of type of projects we like to do. Disadvantages, uh, prepayment penalty within the first 10 years and and there are little nuances within the program where loans can only be paid off uh, at certain times and no investor projects are allowed. Uh, For-profit business only, tangible net worth of operating company cannot exceed 15 million. It depends on the size of, or excuse me, depends on the designation of the area. It can go up to 18.75. Uh, and net profit after federal taxes, not to exceed five million during the previous two years, to uh, about six point two five. Again, if you're in a labor surplus area, uh, what's the real amount? We always get this. If you're a lender, uh, 
you get folks that come in and uh, think that, oh, you know, this is an SBA loan program. You're only going to get small dollars. In fact, I was at a, a function last night and they were surprised about the size of projects that we can do. Speaking of which, typically uh, our portion can go up to uh, five million. And there's sort of an unwritten uh, rule that I know Frank has, has dealt with and we've dealt with here occasionally, where uh, if they add solar or some type of energy saving, they can have additional eligibility. But there's, there's kind of a $15 million mark that is kind of a quiet, quiet thing, but uh, not allowed to exceed. Projects usually range from 250 to about 13 million, 250,000. Uh, eligible borrowers, uh, nonprofit organizations, passive corporations, uh, not, uh, passive businesses, prior to fall on federal uh, loans, uh, we are required to utilize LexisNexis along with the a government database to see if you've defaulted on any of your loans. Uh, it's come up in a big way recently with a lot of the folks that got PPP and idle financing. Uh, so that is uh, something that, that as an SBA lender, we have to vet very quickly. Uh, all other ineligible banks, gambling concerns, and private clubs. Uh, some of the details, and I'm not gonna get too much into this because we'd rather you just reach out to us and, and, and uh, uh, see what's needed to get the loan done but we require feasibility study and key man life insurance in certain, certain uh, uh, projects. Eligible use of proceeds, acquisition of land for construction of new bu uh, building. The, and the, again, this is kind of funky, but if you're, if you're building, your occupancy needs to be about 60%, short-term 20, another 20. If you're buying, your occupancy is only at 51%. Uh, and I want to I want to get into we require personal guarantees. Uh, we do very few startups, but we will do startups if there is some type of industry connection. And as a re requirement on a startup, you have to have a little more equity into it. And if you're doing a special purpose, uh, we do uh, as an industry, we do a lot of gas station C stores. I mentioned the hotels earlier. We also do surgery centers, uh, which is a special special um, uh, purpose requirement. And we are a jobs creation program. So uh, for every 75,000 of our money, uh, we're, we're, you should be creating uh, one job. There are circumstances where it can be waived. Uh, fees, just a glance at the fees. Uh, 1.5% uh, processing fee, debenture fee, one and a quarter. Uh, closing fee is actually going up because of inflation. Uh, the lender fees, about 50 basis points, uh, along with title insurance and everything else. Uh, limited per uh, special purpose, we already talked about that. Uh, yeah, I, again, I'm a cartoon person, so uh, loans. Do you have any other collateral besides email from a Nigerian prince? Uh, the majority of loans, we do not take any additional collateral. It's just the first trust, excuse me, second trust deed on the building that you have. Hey, real quick, Keith, uh, somebody asked a question about credit history. I don't know. So, so, so here's, here's what credit history is in, in our world. Uh, you know, is there a minimum FICO score? Yes and no. Uh, because we are in a second trust deed position, we do a, a deep dive in your ability to repay. And your ability to repay is based on your credit history. So when we pull a credit report, uh, if you are currently in default or you filed bankruptcy recently, that's a no. Uh, but if you have a reasonable debt that may be paid off via refinance or restructure, We'll look at that, but if if you're if you're purely looking at a, a minimum credit score, no. Uh, we it's almost old school kind of lending. Uh, I know that that Frank and I first got in that when we would get a credit report, we would go line by line as to reconciling back what the borrower owed and do they have the ability to repay it. So I don't know if you want to add anything on that, Frank. Yeah, um, 
I myself, until I got to the CDC 10 years ago, I never approved anybody who had a bankruptcy in their past, but we do one or two a year now. Most of them are probably at least 12 years old, 15 years old. We just approved one last week where it was somebody who was in there who was around 50, had a BK at like 19 or 20. So they're mostly older ones. And the biggest issue is really knowing, did the government take any losses on you? Uh, if you had normal consumer debt, you're probably going to be okay, especially if it's 10 years. It seems to be 10 years is the guideline. You know, if it's uh, as far as the SBA, I, I haven't got anything through that had more recent than 10 years. And um, but as long as you disclose it, give us the full facts, and the government didn't lose any money on you, you that shouldn't be an issue. Um, it's the more recent, like PPP and auto loans. If you defaulted on those, you're not going to go anywhere with us. Yeah, and, and the, it's always funny when we have folks come in and and they they hone in on credit and, and we've done enough of these loans where we got a sense of if there's a credit issue or not. Uh, keep in mind we're in a inferior lien position, and as you see on the slide here, you'll have the bank they're in a fifty percent loan, we're at forty percent. So what that means is. If there is a, a issue with the borrower, you know, the bank is going to be a preferential uh, uh, position, whereas we're behind them. So that's why we really look at credit and capacity a little bit more than uh, it's collateral. You, you have a you have a good lean position. Well, you know, in, in, in good times, you get a good lean position. In bad times, you don't. I'm going to go through a couple more slides, but I'm more anxious to talk about uh, uh, what's going on in the future with us here. Just a structure of a kind of a deal. Uh, you know, and we sell this all the time when we meet with borrowers. If they're looking at, if they've been leasing a, a building for a while, uh, their lease payments typically may be a little larger than this 3,000. And if they have 50,000, they can uh, literally get into a, a uh, commercial real estate uh, uh, building here. Processing times, very, very, very quick. Uh, we require almost everything that the bank does on a conventional basis. Uh, there's, I think, one or two documents that are five-minute five minute completions. Approval's quick. Uh, Frank, uh, how fast are you getting loans approved nowadays? Complete package, appraisal, everything. The SBA is about three days, three business days. Three days. And I want to emphasize that, three days. Uh, the key thing is a complete package. Uh, it's like anything when when uh, we start an engagement, uh, if we ask for 10 things, if you bring us eight, then that's not a complete package. So uh, we, we we strive to get everything done and that way you get a, a three-day turnaround. Kelly, I'm going to stop sharing here and I'm going to have you open up for some questions that I think we already have. And you know I have questions. So the first one is going to be, what do you envision the benefits will be for businesses and the local community from this merger? And if you can preface that by, there was breaking news yesterday about a consolidation between the, your two, two organizations. Talk a little bit about that and then talk about the benefits for both the businesses and the community. So I'll take the first part of it, and then I'm gonna have Frank uh, 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 jump in. Yeah, it's uh, this is my last webinar Wednesday, as I teased a little bit. Uh, we uh, Mid State uh, had uh, with discussion. Frank and I had been been talking off and on easily for a year uh, as to he knew I was going to retire. Uh, I had a lot of respect for what they were doing up in up in uh, his markets and the various markets. And our board uh, looked at uh, what they were doing and looked at our needs in Kern County and made the decision to uh, merge with with Cal Finance. So uh, that we are in it's a three step uh, approval process. Uh, Frank has done a wonderful job of shepherding uh, us through it. Uh, we have uh, the SBA has given us conditional approval, uh, which is big. Uh, we got that uh, well within 45 days. So uh, that was uh, done by a lot of, a lot of work. 
uh, was uh, uh, we really appreciate uh, the work that Frank's organization did on that. Uh, now we're at state. Uh, we are, uh, so to speak, on the clock with them. Uh, we're anticipating uh, in the next few weeks to get a response back from them. Uh, then we go back to the uh, SBA. Uh, so that's that's part of the decision making. I am retiring. Uh, so my next webinar will be at the coast. Uh, and I will definitely be, well, it'll be chilly in the coast. So, but I will be in sweat. So. Keith, are you going to be involved after the merger when we get Frank in here? You know, uh, I, I am not, Kelly. And uh, I have been lending since 1978. Uh, yeah, I started as, as a toddler. No, no. Uh, it's It's been a you know great run. Been with MidState for uh, coming over a little over 24 years. And uh, I'm going to pivot to some other other areas. As you well know, I do a lot of volunteer work uh, in the community, and I'm going to do do more of that uh, where we're going to be relocating to the Central Coast. Um, my wife retired, and uh, so I I may I may stick my toe in a little bit of consulting with the SBDC, but. Uh, I want to want to f figure out how it feels to not work for uh, since since I've always worked since I've been fifteen. So I'm jealous. Okay, uh, Frank, uh, what I'd like to do is just have you talk about some of the community benefits we were talking about uh, the organizational structure, and when uh, you and Keith started talking about a consolidation between Midstate and Sincal, uh, talk to us about what led to that decision and where you went from there. Sure. Well, we're excited to be merging with uh, Midstate. Midstate's Keith and Midstate in the last 40 years has really had a great reputation here in Kern County. Uh, Keith and I operate a lot alike. We're very involved in local communities. Uh, we enjoy the agribusiness side of the Valley. Uh, I'm a native of the Valley. I grew up in Hanford, which Fresno State, all that. I had my entire career in Fresno County. Um, and so I'm very proud to be from the Valley. My board is much the same like like I am, and they're very, very committed to the Valley. And, you know, the merger is happening because our cost of doing business has gone up like every other small business. It's hard to find people in lending. Uh, it's hard to find people that want to put the time in that Keith and I have done the last, four, you know, 40 years of our careers or 30 plus years of our careers. So. It makes a lot of sense to merge in this changing world. Technology allows us to do a lot of it better, like these kind of Zoom meetings and stuff. So um, our, our board will be blended between our uh, our SenCal board and a few members from Midstate. Uh, we we just completed a merger on the coast as well with Santa Maria. So we're we have an office there. We have board members from there. So it's a nice fit. A lot of our banks have have gone into non traditional areas as far as. Fresno area banks are, have offices in Bakersfield. Bakersfield area offices have offices in Visalia and Fresno. So they blended. So we're a better fit for them now that they're all think we're all thinking regionally. And then what we're bringing in, we have a uh, about a 25 year experience of using uh, providing microloans as well. Uh, we have two funds in Fresno that are for loans under fifty thousand dollars. For local small businesses in the city of Fresno, we we have an A rating with the EDA. That's EDA money, and with this merger, we're going to take a portion of that and hopefully by summer have a micro loan program here in Bakersfield. And it will be for the greater Bakersfield area, but anybody in Kern County, but primarily focus on Bakersfield. It'll be loans from probably fifteen thousand to fifty thousand. We're going to try to keep them around twenty five so that we can help a lot of small businesses. But we're hoping it's around two hundred thousand dollars. That that part's yet to be determined. But that's probably going to be about the minimum size, I think. So uh, we're going to be using uh, local college interns to do a good portion of that work, so that we can keep the cost down for everybody. Great. And so everything's going to stay the same. The programs will still be the same. The same. Uh, low interest rates will still be available. And, you know, when I when I look at the U.S. prime rate, I look at the Wall Street Journal, it's eight and a half percent. And the other program with the U.S. Small Business Administration is their 7A, their general guaranteed program. And oftentimes we work with clients that get loans that are three percent over that prime rate of about eleven and a half percent. 
What are some of the rates that you're seeing right now with the SBA 504 fixed asset program? Well, our rates are right around 6.6. .6. They were in the sevens a couple months ago. They've dropped uh, almost a full point. And so we anticipate that they'll kind of hover between six and a half, seven, maybe seven and a quarter. Uh, and that's 25 years fixed rate money. Great deal. Uh -huh. uh, and we hope by next summer, they'll start to come down a little bit more and get to the low sixes, hopefully back into the fives. We, I feel strongly that the economy works really well when the rates are between five and six. That way there's enough. If you're around five and a half, six, there's, there's still room for savers to get interest and yet the rate not stop activity. So when it was getting up around seven and a quarter and stuff, we could definitely, it was a quiet summer, but it's been a busy fall and busy winter going into winter. So um, these are great rates. They're below market. Most of the banks are in the sevens and eight area, and we're still able to be in the sixes, which is just remarkable. Yeah, what's, people what's also exciting, Kelly, Kelly, what's also exciting is, is uh, Frank and I talked earlier in, in uh, they recently got one approved, and we recently got one approved where we refinanced an SBA 7A loan. Uh, and so you're talking about, you know, that, that, uh, 11 to 12% rate that you're talking about, Kelly, that's out there, uh, in our cases, we're able to refinance that into, let's say a 6.6% .6 rate. Uh, we projected, uh, one borrower was going to, was going to save at least $3,000 a month. Uh, so you multiply that over, over a lifetime on a year, a, a, a loan what that allows him to do or them to do rather is to hire more people and not have to uh, be dealing with a potential variable rate loan that that could have also gone up higher than that. Right. Same with ours. They're saving at least two grand a month for the next 20 plus years. So it sounds like Kern County businesses will be in fine hands after this all comes down. Um, Let's hit and see if we have any questions that are left unanswered. And then Keith, I want you to wrap it up and just give us what you've seen at MidState over the years. And as we enjoy, as you enjoy your retirement, I won't say we will enjoy your retirement. Um, you know, I was just wondering if, you know, you could wrap up with that. Uh, as far as questions go, um, you know, are you absolutely required to have, this is one great thing about this program, isn't it? Isn't it guys that the collateral is kind of built into the loan itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's it's not a, it, it, it's not a, um, you know, the SBA 7A program is, is a very popular and very good program. A lot of, a lot of businesses have utilized that to start up where, where it's startup working capital combination of things and, They'll collateralize that with real estate and with uh, equipment, a little short of, sort of a shotgun approach. Under Frank and, and, and uh, my program here, ours is strictly real estate driven and some large pieces of equipment. So uh, when we are looking at, at uh, a loan, first off, we're looking at the business. You know, the collateral is just happens to be the real estate but we look at the business first and foremost. Is it a eligible business? Is it a viable business? And does it make sense? And then we look at where we're at on a loan to value. So I don't, I don't know if that's answering the question or not, uh, or not, Kelly. Oh, totally, totally. Um, there was a question that I can't find now on the CTA, and just briefly. Um, on the Corporate Transparency Act, the government is still releasing information or still has to release information on the public information and the form to be used by individuals. Uh, so stay tuned. We'll have more of that as it comes becomes released. I know it's, it's great. It's required to be in January 1 and it's December 13th and there's not a form yet. But be patient. We'll get that stuff to you uh, and get hopefully everybody gets theirs in before the end of the first quarter of 2024. So, Keith, as we wrap things up, talk to us a little bit about MidState, some of the changes that you've seen, some of the things you've seen in your career. Well, and it, it's, it's you know, like I said, I, I've been in the lending arena since 1978 and uh, been with, with MidState uh, right prior to 2000. So 20, 20 uh, plus years 
Uh, and I will say probably 99.9% .9 of the changes, uh, with the exception of some of the regulatory requirements, have been positive. Uh, when I first got into uh, Mid-State, all loans were submitted to uh, Fresno via Overnight Express. Uh, now our loans are electronically submitted to a central processing area. Uh, initially, uh, the sky was falling when they went through uh, central processing. We felt, well, you didn't have the local connection. Uh, well, I will tell you, our turnaround went from uh, potentially one month when it was submitted uh, to a district office to as quick as a day. Uh, Frank mentioned the three-day turnaround, but depending on the workflow, you can get a substantial SBA 504 program uh, loan approved uh, as quick as a day. So, so that was unheard of. That one of the newest things that that uh, has come down on uh, uh, within the last uh, year plus is the ability for us as an industry, depending on our designation, to approve loans. Uh, and then submit it to the SBA. And so uh, our lending amount under the ALP Express is 500,000. So that means typically most uh, purchases of a million dollars or less could qualify for an ALP Express. So what that means is, is uh, Frank uh, and uh, myself uh, through, along with our, our boards and uh, loan committee, can approve a project uh, fairly quickly. So that's exciting. I guess the, the, uh, the, the last thing I'll leave with is the dollar amount. Uh, when we first, uh, or when I first started, uh, the maximum uh, a borrower could have an L SBA eligibility was $2 million. And, but, you know, and that covered a lot of projects. Uh, now the uh, amount, as I showed in the, in the PowerPoint, is five million. You go up to five point five, and depending on uh, the whether it's a manufacturer or energy component, you could potentially get up to fifteen million dollars in SBA financing. So uh, that allows us to deal in, a, in in this environment where, where as Frank mentioned, inflation's up cost uh, of uh, doing business is higher, and we have the ability to do larger projects. So uh, that's just a snapshot. I could probably spend another 20 minutes on the changes that I've seen, but um, uh, excited on the, the merger, excited for uh, my next chapter. And uh, uh, Frank just sort of, he, he talked about the microloan fund. That's big for us here in our area. And Kelly, you know that. We've always needed micro fund, fund uh, uh, lending. So this merger will allow that to happen. So with that, I'm going to, I'm going to stop and kind of sign off. And I will be listening to these webinars from afar. Well, Keith, congratulations on a fantastic career. Uh, I do have this recorded that you will appear on webinar Wednesday in sweats from the coast. So yeah, absolutely. I, I can hold that against you uh, after you get a little rest and relaxation as you start your retirement. Congratulations on that. And uh, it's been great uh, working with you all these years. So with that, we're going to wind things up. Um, we'll be back next week. Webinar number 303. We will have a year in tax tips and some legal tips uh, that go beyond the Corporate Transparency Act and some things that I think some businesses are deficient in some of their legal filings. And so we'll be back, number 303. So for Keith Bryce and Frank Legos, I'm Kelly Bearden. We'll be back next week. So long, everybody. <laughs>